And then yeah, uh, here's here's Nick. Thanks for joining us, man. What's going on? Uh, hey, Nick. Hey. Everything is going on. Somewhere is snowing. Somewhere is sun. Somewhere I don't know. We still don't have rain, but anyway. So the the idea for this uh, kind of gathering was uh, that we kind of look back on what happened in this year uh, and kind of what's what we predict that will happen in, in the next one. So um, basically that's it. I just wanted us to, to dive deeper into what we all have been through, what are some things that we are seeing, what are some conclusions and maybe some, some predictions for, uh, for what's gonna, gonna happen if uh, let, let's see if we can predict what's going to happen because it's it's crazy out there. Do you want to start, Nemanja? Since you <laughs> no no, I will I will give I will give the floor to the to the people. So uh, let, let's form up Nick because he's the last <laughs> one to arrive. Let's let's give him uh, a word. So Nick, my man, it's uh, it's been a lot of changes in. Uh, Especially in, in field marketing and what you do, and it all events change, uh, the whole like ecosystem change in a way. So, what's what's going on from your perspective? How have things been changing, and like how are you able to to survive and adapt? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I mean, my big push is ABM. Um, I'm actually building out like ABM from scratch right now. Um, completely nothing was in place. So so that's the big thing for me. But, you know, just because in-person events are, are gone for right now, like events are actually not dead. It's, it's figuring out how to thrive in a digital world. Um, well, everyone's doing the same thing. And if you can be creative in what you're doing, it all comes back to the content. And if your content's on point, um, people are going to want to come and, and listen to you, whatever it is that you're doing. But we're, we're, I mean, we're crushing it right now. Um, we, we were actually exceeding, we're at a conference. We, we are at a virtual conference. This it's a three week conference. It started last week and, um, it's going for the next two weeks and we're like, the the amount of demos booked i mean in in a week and a half we've already booked 115 demos um and wow. it's just it's yeah it's crazy so you know we're we're hoping that we'll just kind of put that momentum going forward and uh see what happens love it, it it's great so so you're basically spreading events not to be like a one day event but uh, spreading it over over a couple of days and making like a, a long event when there's something happening like on a daily basis if i understand yeah. well so so the one that we're doing right now is aws reinvent so it's like a, it's a third party conference but like they're running it for three weeks and we're just we're kind of spreading out but we, we are doing a lot of our own stuff too um it's just it's, it is just spreading it out because i think in-person events will come back but not till like October of next year. Cool. That's that's something I was listening to LeBron James this this morning or it was yesterday. I, I don't remember, but like he was talking about the uh, premiere of the of the new the new space movie. Jam movie. Yeah. Hmm? The new Space Jam movie, right? Yeah, Space Jam, and he was like, "I'll be happy if like uh, we set it up in July, I think. So I'll be happy if like the cinemas can." Can open and we can have the premiere also like offline, not only digital. So who knows? Like you, you are I think the the better prognoser than than LeBron James is probably. I don't have as much money as him though. Yeah, not yet. Uh, not yet. Hmm. Yeah, that's that, that's good. That's good. So, uh, cool man. Thanks for for the insights. I love it uh to to hear that you are doing well that you are doing some things i also so when i was working with impact hub belgrade we also uh moved events online and also like do do these kind of things not like in three weeks but it's like smaller one in a week when we can we have all kind of different things and all kind of different interactions with with mentorships with uh with pitches demo days also lectures presentations workshops those kind of things 
and it's kind of get people uh, attached to to everything that's going on and basically you are just nurturing them through something that they are already interested in yep absolutely yes yeah, so 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 uh let's see uh juliana what can you tell us because you are doing something uh i would say completely different than than all of us so give us some different perspectives so I mean, my year was very crazy because the e-commerce uh, industry was uh, the most spoiled and uh, privileged this year. And uh, we have seen businesses that have closed down and we have seen businesses that tripled, doubled, quadrupled their sales. So for e-commerce marketing was very interesting because people uh, are uh, rediscovering uh, marketing concepts from the 60s, which is customer centricity and whatnot. So basically now is uh, everyone is on the run for first party data, for customer data, for um, trying to optimize uh, customer lifetime value. And, you know, I'm the anti-marketer. Anti so me, instead of, you know, preaching to the choir, I'm teaching consumers how to not get bullshitted by marketers. <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm a bit, you know, on the, on the uh, anti part, but it's fun. It's been a crazy year and uh, uh, e-commerce grew a lot. We grew when, nine months like we would have i guess you know grown in five years so it's fun i get all these crazy calls with people people that i used to talk to two years ago and i was telling them yo monitor your lifetime value it's going to be important no we're going to do acquisitions acquisitions is the way now they're hitting me back on linkedin i saw your last post you know it got me thinking <laughs> just like dave you know it got me thinking that you have to <laughs> we have to do something so yeah it's fun and uh, it's going to be very interesting all, all for e-commerce, but also for the B2B uh, space uh, next year um, in terms of advertising. I see a death and or a, like a slow death of the advertising companies and PPCs because the third party data is going to be removed from Google. So it's not a new concept, but uh, Twitter did it. Facebook did it. Google is going to do it, too. We have like 13 more months. So all this bullshit uh, advertising companies are pulling right now into getting people's money. It's going to shortly be wiped off. And I'm excited. It's super, super fun times for me right now. And uh, again, I'm just happy I'm in an industry that, you know, challenges me every day with, uh, you know. But the biggest, you know, the, that's why I wanted to ask you because we're all in different industry, but we're doing mostly the same shit. So my question is, what do you guys think is the biggest, biggest obstacle that you have when you're preaching to the choir? Because for me, it's the mindset. People hate to be, you know, challenged. People don't want to be, don't want to have their status quo challenged. They don't want to have their belief systems challenged. So every time you go on the market and you start, you know, gibbering about what you what you have to do and what you have to offer, you just hit on, you just get hit on walls like mindset. I don't need this. I don't need this. So I want to ask, how is it for field marketing or B2B marketing or branding and whatever? Like you guys, do you have it better than me? Because for me, it's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> I mean, for, for me, it's like, you know, you, you got to deal with like, your, the sales reps is basically my biggest challenge in the SDR team. I mean, I got SDRs that, that want to just throw people onto a cadence and like, don't care about personalization. So like, as a buyer of B2B technology, if, if you're an SDR and you're prospecting me and it's basically just a copy and paste, like you're, you're never going to get a meeting with me. Um, it's literally, I will hit delete every single time, but whoever sends me a personalized video, I don't, I, even if I don't need your product, I'll, I'll take a meeting with you because you spent the time to, to put a, a, an actual video together. But that's my biggest challenge, basically getting the personalization and the SDRs and the AEs and the account managers all on board to, you know, not push back against you, but know that you're there to, to help them ultimately hit their goals. And like, it, it's, it's a one team, you know, we're trying to achieve revenue. And um, if everyone's doing siloed things, everyone's going to be, you know, doing their own thing. It's going to suck. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's, what about y'all? Zineb, maybe you can yeah. take, take the mic. <laughs> sure, I grab the mic. Um, I need to get myself a, a new mic like yours. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to, I'm going to answer your question. I think it's, it's really related to what I was going to say, you know, uh, to my answer to, to Nemanja's uh, question. 
is that I think that we're we've been um, very uncomfortable with the, the qualitative data, for example. So we like quantitative, we like, you know, to see things, um, you know, that fit properly in an Excel that, you know, could, could be easily summed up, et cetera. Um, and, and especially I'm referring to um, companies that are, and I know we all preach this, okay? So use your customers' words, um, join the conversation that's happening in their heads, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is, is actually getting to people. I think the next step is is making it easy for them to do it. No, so and and that's where I tie it back to Juliana's question. Is you know first of all there's the mindset thing where oh the qualitative uh, that fluffy fluffy parts. No, no, I'd rather be doing something like put in you know a, a thousand euros in a Facebook ad campaign because that'll give me X, right? So that makes me feel much comfortable. I think the next step, um, at least for me, I'm seeing a lot of uh, success with this and, and positive response is if you show them that it's easy, quote unquote, to do, that it, there is a process and some people have been winning at this, then they're more, they're more open no? um, to, to running customer interviews, to, to digging through that, that gold, no? Um, I call it the the gold diggers, but the, the good kind, right? The good kind of, of gold diggers, because that you are sitting on on a bunch of gold, and you're always looking for what's out there. You know what's what's better, um, and yeah, I think that's for me. That's um, on a professional level, and then what I see next uh, coming up next year, I think, um, and I hope uh, that will be adopted. Hmm. Cool. Uh, Totsi, maybe you want to say something from, from the main gen or B2B or marketing perspective or something else. I know you have some interesting views on the yeah, whole situation. I, I always have interesting views. I don't know, for me, uh, probably I will agree with you, Juliana. The wall, the wall is all around us. And uh, I think the biggest uh, obstacle is to I don't know, to approach to decision makers a little bit different because they think they understand marketing, but actually they don't. They understand PPC and that's probably the biggest problem all these years for all our industry. How to do this in next year? Well, probably that's the next and very, very big in my opinion, crucial question, because it's easier for them. It's easier for them to understand, hey, I want clicks, I want leads, I'll pay for that. And that's easy to be able to understand marketing, to be able to understand demand gen, to be able to understand all different things we are doing on daily basis. They need to actually know something, to put some effort that somehow the, they're not there. It's strange. Let's not call names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just you kidding. Call names, but yes. I feel that pain almost every day. Marty, my man, I know you, you've been uh, listening all this and have something to say to add to it. Yeah, I think personally, I guess I'm in an interesting position because I understand. So before I go into it, for you guys that don't know me, I run an agency called Influence Podium. We help B2B CEOs grow their personal brand uh, by creating content at scale and leveraging their time to achieve that. Uh, so I am both a marketer and a founder. And I guess that puts me in the position of understanding kind of both sides of the table. And understanding how as a marketer you know i want my clients to understand that you know content creation takes time that it's a long-term play that we're building brand and we're driving inbound but that there's no way that we can show him data like we could if we were running paid ads um, but as a founder and ceo i also understand the picture of like are you bringing me revenue or are you not um, so personally i think as marketers we have the option to complain and say Founders don't understand us, marketing teams don't have enough resources, salespeople and marketers don't get along, 
where we can actually start to communicate and take steps to proactively improve that situation. Um, so I think, first of all, a lot of our marketers have to look at themselves and be accountable and realize that they're actually a loss for the company, that they are not bringing revenue, not in the short term, not in the long term, that they're not doing anything that's actually net positive. Um, and for those that are actually bringing net positive stuff, they need to be able to understand how to communicate better with leadership so that they can get a seat on the table, which is something that I guess as marketers we all want, but not few of us actually ever get. Um, so, so that's how I said, obviously there's a big mindset gap between marketers and the rest of people. And we have to do the best that we can to close it. Um, so ju just to kind of answer that question too, and that's where I see it. Um, learning how to communicate as a marketer is very important and keeping ourselves accountable to what results are we actually delivering is, is also very important. Um, to your question, I, sorry. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, you're I right. actually, based on what you were saying, I used to be an entrepreneur and then I started working for a company. So I have the whole founder experience as well. And in my opinion, what, is, what the problem is, is us as founders, as entrepreneurs, we do not like being wrong and we do not like, uh, you know, fucking up. So the problem is when you're, uh, anyone here can, uh, you know, agree to disagree, but when you're running a business, you have that um, mentality all the time that this is my business. I got to make it work. I got to do what I got to do. So sometimes you fail a lot being lost in produ productivity and being so focused on producing results and whatever that you dismiss the fact that you're hiring people to help you. So let's say you hire the marketing team, but you don't let them do what they're hired to do. You don't give them space and autonomy and so on. And as long as that happens, your brain is going to be super fucking high. I actually posted about this today. Your brain is so high on endorphins because you're making shit happen for your company. But at the same time, you're the biggest cut blocker of the company because you're not making, you know, you're not growing. You're just producing super short term results. So then you have a marketing team there that's, you know, capable of doing stuff, but you don't give them the opportunity to do it. And that's how you're not going to grow because your endorphins are not uh, reactive to other people's successes. It's just your own. So I'm not saying all uh, owners are doing that, but I did. And I embraced my shit. I used to uh, hire people and I wasn't letting them do anything because I thought I know how to do it best. And it's the biggest uh, challenge for leadership is the fact that you have to let go and be out of control and just look at things from, you know, uh, you know, uh, from not not from the front line, but you just separate yourself for it from the uh, from the stuff a bit, and allow other people to shine too. And it's something I'm still learning. That's why I never want to go back to being an entrepreneur because I was fucking bad at it. Uh, I was not letting people, you know, do their own thing. No, I, I understand that. That's why I feel for marketers who work for companies when and they don't have a leadership team that understands that and, and gives them the freedom. Because yeah. as a agency we can always fire the client and we've done that before right if, if you hire us and you don't let us do what we're good at then we're going to fire you because it's not worth the money um, but at the same time i understand the perspective of the ceo that's their baby that's their thing that they're taking care of and they it's really hard to give up control to something i have i mean we've talked about this in previous episodes with nemanja i've struggled with as well um, so it's the more communication that can happen between these parties, I think the better. That's something yeah. that I've been really trying to push over the last year uh, and trying to help marketers and salespeople communicate with leadership, something that I see a lot of room for improvement moving forward. Yeah, that's awesome. Super perspectives, guys. Uh, I also look at the things from, from both perspectives and um, it's kind of kind of interesting. Uh, I, from my biggest takeaway as somebody who has been in performance marketing and automation and all those kind of things, what I'm seeing and what's slowly going to unravel is that uh, we are in the, in the space where we are trying to automate everything. And we are uh, now going to learn that we cannot automate engagement. We can not automate going directly to the people, meeting them with where they are. 
and kind of I think that's something that's gonna that's gonna be a change uh, in the future because like not only the SEOs I don't like like just going after SEOs now we are kind of here like marketers going after SEOs uh, CEOs so um, I, I kind of see it everywhere especially in a big systems especially uh, in, in the enterprise when okay you need to automate most of the things but some of the things they need to still be, feel real and be more personal and like be not kind of uh, to look like a stock photo but uh, opposite of it so uh, before we move into kind of what what do we see what's what's going to happen i like to also invite like Ding, Bratza, Alexandra, maybe if they have some questions related to, to that or some overview, maybe you can join the conversation as well. No, I don't have a question. If you guys have questions later, you can just leave them on the on the chat and we'll get to them as well. That's how okay, you then. Play it. Uh, but yeah, Nemanja, we can we can talk about moving forward and when questions come in, I'll, I'll stop you and and then we can wrap from that. Sounds sounds good. Sounds sounds good. So, anybody has an interesting uh, prediction for twenty twenty one? I have except, a ex except the one that that Nick says that we're gonna wait until October for the offline events. <laughs> I don't like that one. <laughs> I, I have a thought that has been in my mind lately for the last two or three months. Um, and would love to hear what you guys kind of think. I'm not sure if it's 2021 or if it's 2022 or 2025, uh, but I, I'm very interested in the role of AI and content marketing. Uh, so one of the things that we do is, uh, as a service, we help you start a podcast or we help you be guest on other people's podcasts. And within, we repurpose that into content for social, we repurpose that into videos, written posts, articles, tweets, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, kind of everywhere. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Gary Vee content model, but something very similar to that. And, and there's this AI company that kind of does this automatically. Uh, I think it's called Friday.ai or, or something like that. I, I'll give you guys the link later. Uh, but basically they're working on the technology to kind of be able to repurpose content find what's going to be the most better performing content out of a large pillar piece of content and then find the best snippets, find the best tweets, find the best clips and do that automatically within a minute. What would take us, you know, a couple of weeks to achieve that. Um, they're not there yet in terms of quality, but honestly, I don't think they're that far either. So it didn't really worry me because there's a lot of clients to go around and all that, but it's interesting to see how AI is starting to like play a role. And I wonder what role would be in, what role will it play in the future? I've also seen AI automate sales copy and it, I tried it and it was not great, but it wasn't bad. So also I'm very interested in how that AI is performing. I don't know if you guys have seen anything like that or what thoughts you guys have on, on that uh, side of content. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, if I'm just going to jump in here. Ahead, yeah. AI, super, you know, always watching out for, for the next thing to, to test it out. Uh, when it comes to copy copywriting, definitely there are a few, um, a few solutions out there. They're not perfect, but they definitely got a wow out of me, you know, because it's, uh, if it's, you know, it's this good right now, uh, I can only imagine what it'll be, uh, how good it will be in, in six months time and in, in a year's time. There's another one called Genie that does, um, you know, you just give it a big PDF with, you know, a research paper or, or a book and it'll, you know, in addition to other things, it'll give you uh, a summary or highlight the, the most important points, which I think is just, uh, is just amazing. Again, it's not perfect, but give it six months. It'll be, it'll be amazing in terms of content. Um, I could definitely, I, you know, I'd love to check out the tool that you mentioned. If you drop the link, Marty, that, that would be, that would be awesome because I'm doing, you know, we brought up the, uh, the whole idea of doing things manually, right? Uh, there are certain things that you still need to do manually. I'm, I run this, uh, video series 
uh, I had a chat with Juliana this week. <laughs> so basically, it's just a recorded uh, Zoom call. What I do is I pick out a short snippet, 30, 40 second snippets, and I do, you know, just put on some subtitles, nice headline, and a bit of editing, and that's content for, for either that person or myself, right? Um, my biggest challenge there is where's the best snippet? No? And, and that's something that you cannot outsource because they don't have, you know, they're not, they weren't in that conversation, you know, it's, so it's a very, very challenging uh, part. So keen to have that, to have that outsourced. Again, there are certain things that we still need to do ourselves. Um, so I don't know if that's, that's going to be part of it or, or not, you know, like customer interviews, for, for example. Um, I don't know if that's ever going to be uh, outsourced you know, or, or at least with, with AI, that would be really interesting. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if, I, I think there's a human factor in understanding bra the brand and the voice and what snippets or what pieces of content make the most sense for a specific brand. Um, and I remember a client of us told us that he, that he had tried, you know, using the AI tool and it was good, but it wasn't good enough. And our work was, much more personalized to him but then again in two years how is that going to look like um so so as a founder working on that space you know, i'd rather catch it before it's too late um so i'm very super interested i'm trying to find the link i don't remember the i'll put, I'll put it down it's a cool topic that you brought out and um i am fascinated about it because i work in data <laughs> And um, one application that uh, I actually had the chance to, you know, uh, play with is machine learning, which is uh, obviously an application of um, AI. And we uh, developed a software that does A-B testing on automated pilot. And uh, trust me, it's amazing when you can, we don't have to think about hypotheses. You don't have to think of, you know, what types of experiments you can do. You just... Uh, we just use uh, 13 uh, cognitive biases. So basically you just uh, let the machine learning learn how to you know, do experiments and take you closer to the, to the buying uh, cycle. And we actually got an investment from the European Union for that software. So it's something that we're working on in the, uh, in the background. So for conversion rate optimization, this is really, really important because ha doing A-B testing and coming up with shit all the time, it's a very time consuming thing. So having a machine that does all of this for you and, you know, shortens the whole buy buying cycle and helps people decide faster. It's super, super interesting. So yeah, great, uh, great topic, uh, Marty. Yeah, I will also... Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say you, you just wrote an article on, on those topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, I'm trying to teach people about the cognitive biases. This is how you do social media. You have to put the inception, you know, from time and just, just drop it, you know, slowly. But um, I just it's a link in the comments if anyone wants to check it out. Um, yeah. Please don't give too much promo because they're kind of our competitors. But, so keep it quiet <laughs> to yourselves. But, but that's Perfect. a link of the company. I'm also very excited about AI, and I don't know. I, I'm really interesting in different different types and different possible. I don't know variation and how we can use it. Uh, uh, I, I was like reading articles GPT three wrote. GPT three is like uh, uh, text processing AI, and I don't know what to say. Am I just copywriter, copywriter? I will be afraid for my position in the near future because he's good. I mean, he, she, or it, or whatever, uh, because article is like really, really good. And I understand, uh, as you, Marty, said, uh, probably we'll need to wait a little bit more, but it's very, very close, maybe. Maybe AI is still missing some deeper understanding. I don't know, but it can it can be done very, very fast. Six months, one year, and boom. Yeah, I, I just want to say something real quick here. And I think that it, in that I, I agree with you, um, Ivan, that it'll be it'll be quicker than than we think. Probably, and, probably quicker and, than yeah, we think. Quicker than we think. It's just about how do we 
you know, in the whole um, learning process, you know, uh, while the machine is learning, how do we feed it what's good and what's not? So when it comes to content, um, especially in, in Marti's case, um, so it's content that they come up with, that they put out there, that has gotten certain engagement, um, certain impacts, and then has had a result in uh, sales down the line. Right. So how do you feed the machine that sort of, you know, how do you tell the machine that this content is good? It did well. It That one didn't well. You know, when you have so many other things like posting time, like audience, uh, et cetera. No? Yeah. I, I remember um, last year I talked with this founder of a Silicon Valley company that basically what they did was um, with using AI, they were able to analyze and audit which ads would perform better. Uh, so they were more focused on D2C. Um, I'll, I'll try to put the name as well. Uh, but basically, by analyzing analyzing all um, a big data set of uh, paid ads and creatives, they were able to see what creative looked more the same as those that had performed better in the past. Um, so I do think that can be something that can be translated eventually into our content marketing strategy. Um, and if you're able to be able to create the content automatically and then know which content is gonna perform the best because certain keywords trigger better performance or uh, certain graphics triggers better um, content performance, then honestly, I'm kind of scared for my job. I, I, looking back, like if, knowing what I know now, obviously I'm very happy running my agency, but if I wanted to create something that was bigger, I would probably focus on that. And I do with this company that I put the link before doing. Um, I think for the next one or two years, they might not be fully ready, but in a few years, you have to use them. It's just mind blowing what they can do and how quickly. Am I any okay, so, so what's the prediction except the AI? What are you predicting? What's going to happen with uh, with uh, with some other with some other things that, that we are seeing around? Are the like MQLs going away? Are the CEOs uh, start being active? Uh, are the advertising agencies really dying? What what's going to happen in the next year? Who's going to be the bravest one and just predict something out of the sudden? I see more fighting and more debating on LinkedIn, by the way. I, I, I see people going more at each other um, and treating more LinkedIn like Twitter versus being so respectfully as they are. Uh, I, I think more, there's going to be a bit more of intense debate and on LinkedIn, which is good because I think sometimes it can be boring. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing, I see a rise of live podcasts like this one. And I think you and I and Emanuel should take credit for that, even though we probably don't deserve it. But the live podcast, I, that's where I see podcasting going in the future. Cool, I like it. Marty, what, can what? You, uh -huh. I want to ask a quick clarifying question. So like uh, when you guys say live podcast, uh, like is this recorded right now or, or are you referring live as in like this is in the moment and if you're not here, you don't get it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think both so you have to record it but people can join while you're doing the podcast so kind of like a I see. radio show where you can it's like a freestyle yeah where like people can call in and ask questions on a radio show that's where i see it in podcasting as well so you have the podcast mm. that's what how we do it every wednesday in the and i we have it there's a few people that yeah. join us while we do it they ask questions. Usually we do the first 30 minutes, you know, debating certain topics that we have in mind. And then the next 30 minutes doing Q&A. Uh, and then we record it and put it out as a podcast. Um, so it's kind of like gotcha. a webinar slash podcast. That's, that's how I see more engagement from the audience. Like it, it'd be nice to be there while Tim Ferriss is interviewing somebody. Uh, or, yeah. you know what I mean? That, that's how I see yeah. podcast. I think even, so as my first time on this, um, just shout out Juliana, shout out Nemanja. I found uh, finding this this little panel 
Uh, but I, I really enjoyed the format and the content uh, as a participant in this way. I feel like it does bring a different level, especially when you get this kind of live feedback too. Yeah, I think podcasting, it kind of like leaves the audience behind. So you record it in private and then you put yeah. it. Yeah, it's, one, it's a one-sided content, yeah. Exactly, versus doing it, that's, two-sided with people coming in. Sorry, I'm eating, guys. i just hang on. Um, when people come in and can ask questions and be involved, and see the mistakes. Nemanja and I have made mistakes before. There were people there. You just have to own them and, and keep going. Um, but I think it makes it more real and more, re- more relatable. I agree. We, we have been doing our podcast live since March, since it wasn't cool. And it's, people just come and shit on you online. It's what it is. But at least it's more authentic. And um, as you are saying, Marty, it's, it's more interactive. And uh, I agree with you. It's more and more people are going to try to get this format and, uh, and do it. We've been doing it on Crowdcast. And you don't know who's going to see, <laughs> who's going to get there. You know, when they see people that, you know, that they admire and then, you know, they they're either happy for us or they're shit on us. <laughs> it's, it's a, you know, it can be either way. So yeah, dope, dope prediction. I see that too. And, and Emanya and I don't sell anything, but if we had to sell something, it's even better when you can do it live with people there. Um, yeah. For brands that are, you know, putting podcasts because they actually have something to sell. Um, that can also be an interesting option to treat like a webinar kind of, but it's actually a podcast. Um, I don't know, just, just thinking that's where I'd like to be as, a, as an audience member. So I'm guessing that's where we'll evolve this podcasters. Uh, drop, it, drop it till it's hot. Uh, so LinkedIn, LinkedIn is hot. We are all over there. What do you think will happen to the platform next year? Where the things are going to go? Are we still going to have like organic reach uh, as it is right now? I don't see it like being lower, maybe a little bit, but engagement is going up. Yes. Yeah. So those are kind of the things that, that I'm seeing. Um, also, I don't know, are we going to go more with, with those newsletters that like specific people have? Are we going to go more with, with LinkedIn Live? Uh, I don't know even what's going on there. Like, I have notifications blocked for, for LinkedIn Live. Uh, and so I don't see when anybody goes live except when I see it in the feed. I don't, I barely see anyone except maybe Jake Dunlop when he's doing some things. Uh, but you know, where do you see things going as more and more people starting to produce content? Since right now it's like maybe, maybe 10% of the people of the pl- on the platform are really creating the content and even less people are actually creating quality content. So it's, it's obvious that more people are going to start creating more quality content as they go, as they learn, as they develop themselves, as they come from other platforms also because they heard like LinkedIn is the thing. Uh, how do you see it? I see it as like for the next 10 years, it's going to stay the platform for the B2B. Now, how it's going to change, let's, let's discuss. I think LinkedIn right now, it's a, it's a hot mess <laughs> because it's a lot of testing and experimentation. I, we experiment all the time with this, with uh, different posts. And in my opinion, from what I see, it's half of the people trying to stick to their old ways and just posting company updates and bullshit that no one reads. And then you have people that are actually creative. And the problem with being creative is that you, when you, so I have a big problem. Everyone who sees my content knows I'm a big troll. It's what it is. I'm a huge troll. And the way I, the, the, the reason I am uh, like this is because people will come on LinkedIn and they have the impression that they need to be like this professional person that has no fucking sense of humor that cannot show emotions or anything. So then you see people like being, I'm so happy you're here. And he produces so much dope content that with his videos and he's so talented. And he goes out there and does his thing. And this is the type of creators, you know, that you want to see people that challenge, you know, that boringness of what's a business person supposed to be. So I like people on LinkedIn that have sense of humor. And I think in the next years is going to be definitely a creator platform. It's definitely going to be B2B, as as you said. But it's also going to be a creative platform because all this bullshit that you see right now with math problems and do you agree, but do you agree? But do you really agree with me? This is gonna disappear, you know. This is this is bullshit. All this Oleg, uh, you know, Olegesque stuff, Bridget, and all those. All, I, I have LinkedIn since 2010. I've seen all facets of LinkedIn. <laughs> Trust me. Ten years ago, 
it was bad. People were sending mad problems. They were saying like this and I'll pray for you tonight. Jesus made this miracle. Like it was bullshit. So now, you know, that all the, you know, uh, league of LinkedIn is kind of going down. And then you see cool, cool people, you know, like you guys that experiment different types of content that you come up with the storytelling. So everyone that doesn't tell a story is not going to survive. People like stories. But I'm not saying, you know, the, the rags to riches stories because everyone got bored of <laughs> that one, you know, like, like, you know, I wasn't shit, but I'm great right now. Do this and so you can be cool like me. You know, it, but when you read, like I, for instance, let me tell you my favorite post of you guys. I like uh, 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 Zineb's post with uh, the LinkedIn people that post shit. Horrible. The worst content comes from LinkedIn people. And then when she went back to the profiles and see the things that she posted first, like this is the type of content that I want to see. Um, I like things, every, every post he puts is cool. I like hip hop. So when I see him doing his thing, it's awesome. I like your content, man. Uh, Nemoj, I like your content, bro. Your content is good. Like the, when you posted that picture with your family and you told the story, this is the type of stuff I want to see. And like you are educating people not necessarily through what you sell, it's how you write and how you tell your story. And I think this is what people need to learn on the platform, how to tell their story and not to copy you because I'm sure all of you guys are being copied. My stuff just gets copy pasted and I see uh, people that used to be my prospects years ago posting my content. I'm like, really bro, <laughs> what the fuck? But you're teaching people right now. I mean, in your sector, I think it's amazing what you guys are doing because you're teaching people how to tell their stories and, uh, I like that, you know, that, that's awesome, instead of the crap. And then is the cool part of LinkedIn that you guys need to deep, get more deep into, which is the Dave that you know, Nemanja, like it's those type of people. And those are like the people that are gonna move the change, you know, on LinkedIn is the people that just are true to themselves, you know, and don't know, go all this businessy shit. No one cares for that anymore, man. We're humans, you know, we, we, you know, outside of LinkedIn, we laugh at nine gag and uh, I don't know, tenor, or we look on Instagram and watch Michael Blackson's life. Let's be real. Like this, this is who we are, you know, but on LinkedIn, you just have to, you know, pay this, uh, you know, this whole appearance of being, I don't know who the fuck, but you know, we all watch TV Tuesdays and watch little Duval's post. So it's, it's, it's what it is. And that's what I have to say in my uh, Slavic suit. You know, I'm just going to jump in here. Uh, how There's a fine line, no? Uh, there's a fine line between this is LinkedIn, this is not Facebook, right? Is it is LinkedIn going to be the next Facebook as we see, you know, pictures of cats, inspirational posts, etc. cetera? Um, what's what's going to happen there? And yes, we are human and humans have cats. They have, you know, they go on walks in the weekends with their kids. They, they do dumb shit they want to share and that's part of them and they want to share it in this platform. So I don't, I don't see what the problem is as long as you diversify your content, you know, I'll post inspirational stuff once in a while, but if that's all I post, I'll be, um, you know, I'll have a sticker of, you know, she's inspirational. Right. So I think it's not overdoing it in certain types of content and a sort of diversifying your your content. But I'd like to say that for hopefully for next year, there's the Gen Z, uh, you know, Gen Z LinkedIn, I think, is not doing a good job is it, it welcoming uh, Gen Z when they do. We should all be scared, you know, when they do end up, uh, you know, being real monthly average uh, um, users, right? Because right now, most of them are just forced to have accounts. Uh, maybe at college, they're forced to have an account, etc. But it's it's very intimidating. They don't understand it. They don't know how to, they see it as a place to get jobs, right? Because it's been sold to them as a place to get jobs. Um, so as soon as LinkedIn changes that, then maybe, heck, if you're going to do stories, give us some better things to put in our stories, you know, because those those little stickers are are very crappy, um, to be honest. So you have to create them on Instagram to, to do anything decent yeah, exactly. on, on LinkedIn. So it's just an example. I think that, and I hope, uh, it's not so much of a prediction, but it's a, a wishful thinking that I really hope that in the, the plan to, to welcome Gen Z, you know, um, they actually make, make changes in, in, the, in the platform. Yeah, my prediction is that they want. 
Like, I think LinkedIn is the best worst platform in the world. Like, it has the best audience, it has the best possibilities, but it's so terribly managed that they won't welcome Jay's Generation Z, and they're gonna go somewhere else, and eventually that's why they're gonna die, because they're gonna run out of users that appreciate the platform and know how to use it. It's gonna go back to being a resume holder, if that. So, interesting to see what's the new platform that comes up. Uh, I think we should all keep an eye on that. Um, because mm -hmm. going first, we'll have the, obviously the biggest advantage. Uh, back to the content that Julian was mentioning. Honestly, I don't think we're anybody to tell what people should post and should not post. And what content is made for that platform and what content is made for Facebook. I think those are all social constructs that we have created as marketers. And we're like the rich people trying to tell the poor people what to do. I think the market decides. If you put out cut videos and that brings a lot of views to your site and do, and if you're selling something and that converts, like fuck, do cut videos, I don't give a fuck. Do whatever you have to do to end the end result, which for me is inbound revenue. If inbound revenue comes from cut videos, it comes from cut videos. If it comes from storytelling, it comes from storytelling. If it comes from actual expertise, it comes from actual expertise. Uh, but the market decides and we're not anyone to put limits to what that content should be. We, we might have personal preferences, but we're all at the mercy of what the market wants, at least in my opinion. I didn't mean that we are telling people what to do. I think we are all, all not just all of us in this panel, all on LinkedIn that constantly put content. We are helping people that never posted the day in their lives to get you know, the balls one day to post something. And it happens, you know, even if you guys don't wanna, you know, to say it it happens not just us us in general the people that post you know we post because we see that consistently posting it brings some results be it inbound marketing inbound leads cats i don't know whatever that you're looking for and it's in, you know it's helping other people post the, the you know on their own I, I i i saw a lot of people that never posted the day in their lives but seeing you know like commenting and you know whatnot they end up posting and it's good because, you know, this helps the market decide exactly what you said. What, what do they want, right? So we are at the mercy of, you know, what people actually want to see. So that's why it's great that it's diverse. And, you know, all that Facebook is not LinkedIn thing. For me, you know, I don't. That's, a, that's an old debate. Yeah, like I don't. Really, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I, I want to hear Ivan because he's on LinkedIn longer than any of us. And like he used to get followers while we, we were just building a in, in, in good old days on LinkedIn. And so you've seen it all. Like you build the audience yeah, yeah, yeah. with with featuring your articles uh, by LinkedIn, just by going that now you adapted to changes. So that's true, that's true. Five, six years ago. How do you see the things gonna develop? Well, f first, I just want to clarify one thing about reach and engagement, at least my, my opinion about that. Yes, engagement is good. And I don't know, a lot of us have uh, an opinion that uh, reach is going down. Hey, maybe it's up to us because we are trying to produce more and more content. And doing that day by day, post by post, maybe our posts are not as good as before because you need to provide, I don't know, one piece. Neman is providing two, so sometimes three pieces per, per day. It's hard to, uh, to be to be good all the time. And I don't know, it's literally impossible. So I think Rich is still okay, but our subjects is maybe not that uh, well resonating with our audience all the time. Because when, when, I, when I write a good post, hey, Rich is good, engagement is good, but it's hard to do that all the time. And uh, next thing for, Next year, cat advertising, it will be a big thing. Storytelling with cats. And I have two cats here and one dog, and I'm sitting on a gold mine. What can I say? <laughs> Brace yourself, cats are coming. Okay. 
Oh, it's gonna be a nightmare if they come. I don't know, guys, you were all saying about cats, about funny videos. I don't see any of those shit on LinkedIn. Like you need to unfollow people and you need to clear, clear up your feeds. Uh, but I need to do it too, but I cleared it enough, uh, obviously. So, uh, Marty, how much time do we have until the end? Uh, I don't have a, we, I mean, we have six minutes until one, I mean, 7 p.m. your time. Um, we, I don't have a then hour today. Um, Martin is letting us speak more. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you guys are, are good. So something that I've seen on LinkedIn, uh, and I think that's the biggest goldmine that companies are missing on, is I think it's called employer branding, but I'm probably confusing the term, which is just having a bunch of people within a company create have a strategy together and interact together and grow together. That's where I see LinkedIn growing. And honestly, I think that's the biggest opportunity that maybe like four companies have caught on. And once companies between 50 to 1,000 employees get that, I think it's game over. Like it's for them to take it and run with it. Um, I think Nemanja and I have actually talked about you know, doing workshops to companies about helping them create that and create that structure where they're promoting people and growing the personal brand of employees um, and having their sales team create content, their marketers create content, their leadership create content. I focus with my company just on the CEO. But if I had 24 more hours in, in the day, I would focus on building those programs for companies. So that I would buy it for my own company because in my company, it's just me and my boss posting right. anything. No, and I think it's, it's uh, and I mean, it's important to do this like this was mind-blowing and i hope you guys do it because i'll be the first buyer <laughs> to do it for my company it's just so easy when you have so many of those employees because it, it acts like yeah gong gravy uh swiss swiss house yeah, or whatever the fuck they're called um they do that too um and like it just acts like an engagement pot of sorts but but an actual real one because you have like 30 people interacting with each other and commenting on the post, it's going to drive the algorithm crazy. Plus, you're creating an infrastructure to create great content. I think it's such an opportunity for people. And once you have that, if LinkedIn dies, you can transfer that to another platform and pick it up right away. Um, that, that, that's the yeah, like LinkedIn is is a great platform for exactly that, Marty, that you that you said for for scaling employees in that way. So. Uh, and let me tell you, I don't know if you have heard, but like uh, Gong has 10 or 11 active people on LinkedIn. There are like maybe four uh, other people who are semi-active and that's it. Like that's, that's enough for everybody to say Gong is the best on LinkedIn. So that, that's all it takes. But uh, LinkedIn is actually what's happening inside of the company. And when you just extend it to LinkedIn, then it shows. Like, um, I'm right now starting to work with a huge company, like 600 employees, and they already have some things in place, but like, as Marty said, like a pod, they are all gathered in a, in a group, sort of like marketing nucleus or, or other, uh, people when, where they have like, uh, people, but they are engaging only with their content, and their page, they're trying to build up the page, uh, and, and to kind of grow and they, and what I've seen, like they have sort of like awards for the people like weekly awards and also like monthly award when somebody is uh, the person who is the most engaged like they just send him the dinner or her the dinner to their address like those kind of things which are not expensive for the company but is a great award somebody's thinking about you, you know the, just the the food or whatever arrives at, at your place just because like you you were active and then like it's just the next phase is imagine what will happen with a company of like 600 people let's say 50 of them are, are active semi-active so imagine what will happen when they start interacting with people who are not their colleagues or their relatives but the people who are uh, part of their target group target accounts so it it's going to be a takeover. I mean, Drift did that back, back in the time. I was just talking with, with Sarah Pion on the, on the podcast when she told me like Drift hire all A players from the start. Like 
imagine how hard is that when you know that you want to build a hyper growth company and you just go and hire all A players. So the pressure is on to everybody. Everybody needs to learn and everybody were active. And it was shown like Drift was the first company that did that, took over of the LinkedIn. Every, everybody in the feed, when you log in, had like Drift t-shirts or was saying about Drift, talking about Drift. That's how they created the, the new category and those kind of things. So uh, kind of interesting to see where things are going and who's going to be the first one to to actually do that. Those are kind of the things that we are doing also uh, as part of our services for the companies. So we, we are getting there. Uh, also, like I'm seeing a lot of companies also get into uh, new products, which are like the news product of what they're already doing. Like, uh, how's it called? From, uh, from Gravy, Casey. Like, yeah, they are creating sort of like that personal brand thing. I don't know what it is yet, like something uh, like education or whatever, something something like that. But people are thinking about it and, and thinking about like personal brand for the companies as, as a product, because obviously there's a need for that. And um, I mean, basically, we, we come up to the point where people are realizing that uh, a lot of B2B tech companies, SaaS or whatever, um, People is their strongest asset, and, and they and they don't show it to anybody. They are like kind of trapped inside the company, locked down, and nobody will see will see the light uh, when they until they go out of the company. And uh, so this is the biggest treasure and something that, that needs to be exposed. And when they start doing it, uh, that's when the things are going to change for for the B two B industry. That's how I see it. I got, a, I got a question for you, Marty. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, so, this is a super important topic for me because I've been dealing with, you know, convincing people. What, how, what do you tell people in the company that don't, you know, don't, don't like social media? They don't like posting. And imagine, you know, there are people might be. I'm not talking about developers because I get developers. You know, they're busy. They wouldn't have time necessarily if they work on a product. But, you know, salespeople, marketing people, and they don't want to post. You know, what do you tell those people? How do you convince them? That's my question. How do you convince them? Marty, I know, I know, I know the answer is uh, why Juliana isn't listening to B2B Weekly, because we answered already. Right? Oh, send, me the link. send me the link, for real, because I want to send it to my company, because this is a topic that really interests me. So now I'm out of the podcast panel mode. Now I'm like in business mode. I'm listening to you guys like this. Because this is very interesting for me. Because it's something I've been dealing with, and you know, and I'm not ashamed to admit, you know, it's it's hard to convince people to to start doing this. Yeah, we'll, we'll send you a link. I, I think we, we had different answers. We had answer of you don't convince them, and you focus on the people that are low hanging fruit. Start with that. Mm-hmm. I think it also involves who you hire in the future. It, it's because, for example, I was really close to hiring this guy. You guys probably know him. His name is Tyler Birch. He's on LinkedIn. A young kid uh, out of the States, um, super close to hire him. He decided to go another route, which is fine. But one of the main reasons that we wanted to hire him is because of his LinkedIn audience. Because, um, take care, Alexander. Because uh, he came in with a built in audience, which we knew that he was going to help us start building that program a la Gong, a la Drift, uh, because he was already in that mindset and he could generate opportunities for us. So that was one of the reasons I was willing to pay a premium for him versus somebody else. Um, but, and then it comes about explaining the mind. It's about trying to integrate the mindset and showing results about how you, what you're gonna be able to achieve if they buy in the program. And when you have the buying consensus about creating the infrastructure to do that. Um, but if you really think about it, you're, the ROI that you would have to, or the money that you would have to spend to get the exposure from like 10 or 12 employees creating content consistently, if you bought LinkedIn ads, is absolutely insane. So it's even worth it to like hire one or two people if you're having 50 employees that are willing to be part of the program and you're still making a huge ROI if you'd rather invest it on paid ads on LinkedIn with how expensive they are. Um, so the, honestly, the, I, like I said before, this is the biggest opportunity I find um, in trying to convince and, and getting less pushback, uh, like Ding mentioned before. Um, I think we've touched on it in other episodes, so we'll, we'll get the link. But yeah, send, me, send me 
but the link that's, the that's where it's because uh, it allows you to scale content so much because if you have 50 employees who buy in now you're able to create 50 pieces of content on linkedin per day like that if they get a thousand views each which is low you're getting 50,000 views that are targeted to your audience on linkedin every single day like there's no way that doesn't come up with like an actual roi even if you give them two hours a week to create the content for linkedin and you pay, pay them for that um but yeah i, th I think it's just finding the founders that understand that mindset and then just helping them with infrastructure no matter we need to get on that man yo do it i'll promote yeah and it. and also like one more one more thing i would like to add because um i'm talking to a lot of people these days because uh we're considering maybe hiring somebody because like the work the, the the amount of work that needs to be done is is growing and like i don't want to hire somebody who is he has experience only on linkedin like just posting on linkedin building an audience over there okay i like it but uh did you try something else maybe you failed okay maybe you learn how did you come up with with all those things do you know actually how to track the analytics how to see what's going on do you know some some other stuff because like uh, there are a lot of people who can be good at LinkedIn for themselves and I appreciate that but can they repeat it for 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 a client for you for someone else this is kind of the tricky part that not many of them can do it they cannot change the message they cannot change the tone they can uh, cannot do it in a different way not of the co all the companies are funny let's say you know so you cannot be entertaining everywhere some of them are like security companies what you're going to do when that happens what you're going to do with uh with some with some other companies that where where you need to be to be more creative than what you are right now uh so i need somebody who um need to see actually more people who are diving deeper into what they do uh like trying out things going into into the dirt not only like this is this works let's just build it in let's go to fifty thousand followers and then what like okay super there are some people who i appreciate that like build something on instagram did they move to linkedin they, they learn the pattern because like uh i think instagram is a bit different and people who actually made it over there uh, I think those people have something it's different than than uh, I said, the LinkedIn. Uh, they, they figure out some patterns which are different than LinkedIn. And some of them, I talk to a lot of people who build the huge audience on Instagram. They weren't aware that they, they know how to do it. They didn't know how to do marketing. They didn't know how to develop uh, even a brand for themselves and uh if you explain it a little bit to them if you if you guide them and come to show them like those things that you have done this is actually how it's done you just didn't know that those are the steps and kind of like all those kind of different different things that, that i would like like to see and so like when people are pitching us ah, you we know that you're big on linkedin like that's what we like i grew my account from eight to twenty seven uh, thousand people and like that's it okay but what else is in the, the CV? Like nothing. I have a music YouTube channel. Okay, but is it even optimized? No. Uh, so like I need uh, approaching the days when like marketers and, and people need to be good at so many different things. Like not only in, in one single thing. Like I was talking with, with Juliana also about about some of some of these things uh, like it's kind of interesting when you do different things like when you can jump up like on the strategy when you can create content then you can check the analytics to see how everything works like i want to see people who are interested in how their content how their content performs like is it driving revenue is it driving traffic whatever is is the goal but i want you to be uh, interested to see the results, to find out what was going on. Like, uh, I don't know, like kind of, those are some of the things that, that I want to see. Uh, I still see copywriters, which are like saying you, they start working with a brand and they like write an email and that email like sells, I don't know, uh, 4,000 euros. 
uh, and they're like, oh, I, I did great with an email. Like, bro, you just wrote one email. The company did the rest before you came. And, and like, I don't see people talking about it. There are still so many things underneath that we need to dig to actually get to the part that like eliminate the bullshit and email, eliminate the thinking. And let's get real about something. It's good. This this is this is the po the podcast for the rent. <laughs> <laughs> I I just want to um, go back to and I absolutely agree with you, especially the last point. So uh, the generalists, I, I think that there's going to be a bigger need for for generalists uh, going going forward. Uh, but you talked about the employee content machine, right? That that we can. Uh, we can take advantage of and i'm i'm all for it i second that absolutely um but you said Nemanja, you said a, a really important piece of information because one thing is it being sort of like a pod where people will engage with other employees um, uh, posts but if you don't at the same time engage with people from your target audience outside of the company then your feed is just going to be filled with you know your employees um posts so I think I just wanted to to bring that up again because I think it's really important to have, which is why it's so hard to, to convince people to to get on there because it's not just liking and commenting on a post. It's actually being active on LinkedIn, right? Um, bye bye, Jules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, lucky lucky us that don't have kids yet. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So let's yeah. let's kind of. Uh, yeah. You're good. Keep going. Yeah. I just meant let's kind of uh, get the the last points of it. So kind mm -hmm. of like go into into wrapping it up and like maybe we can start with with Totsi. Maybe some something for the end. Give us like an outline. <laughs> or, or, or let me think about it. I don't know. <laughs> I'll be, I'm jotting down, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will just add a few things be before that. Uh, because uh, I, I study what Casey did uh, with his gravy team. And I don't know, he came out, came out with a principle 10, 3, 1. So uh, he, advise, he advised people to do to add uh, 10 new connection to comment on a three post and to write a new post each day and that's it so mm -hmm. in my opinion that's not enough mm -hmm. so i i'm really excited to see how some bigger companies enterprise will go in next year on linkedin because i, I really agree if someone uh, big enough goes strong on linkedin it will be a game over for their competition so <laughs> i'm really expecting to see something like that and not not for us though it won't be game over for us. It will be everything. No, it will be a go yeah. golden era for us, but <laughs> game over for their com competition. Well, I think it'd be good for us because I yeah, think yeah, it will mm -hmm. be great. Yeah. Golden era and because revolution more, in marketing. Yeah, because the more people believe in marketing, the better for marketers. I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How's it called in America? A rising tide rises all boats or something like that? You guys know. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to end like it's not going to happen because they have too many, too many people that have the old mindset and it might happen in a, in a like few years when, when the majority of people are younger because like look at the companies that are dominating the, the LinkedIn. Those are the companies that exist not more than five years. But we only, so, need, we, we only need one company that has... 100 plus one, one sleeping giant one sleeping yeah giant. And, it, and it's not gonna be an enterprise that uh probably not an enterprise that already exists or that already has 100 plus employees it's gonna be a company that's gonna be built instantly and gonna take over and uh like they said that about enterprises also for the facebook ads like facebook ads will die enterprises won't enter the space still so it's, it never happened. And like, I also 
think about that on LinkedIn. We're going to have some new companies, some hyper growth companies that uh, are going to be like newly built companies with, with people coming over there that know what they're doing, that know that like personal branding is what it's all about. They know that they need to show their skills and they believe in the company, in the mission. And this is the kind of companies that's going to take over everything uh, in the store. Honestly, I disagree with that. I, I think I know, I know. <laughs> an existing company with a young founder who understands social media and understands marketing and have a company of between 50 and 100 employees, that, that's all you really kind of need. Um, and then a consultant that can help them. Um, but obviously, it, it's easier if it's a younger company and they could have that as a mindset from, from the beginning. Um, but super interested to see if this actually becomes more of a thing. Man, I'm trying to do, do that. I'm, tr I'm trying to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to implement yeah. it. So let's, let, let, let's see if it happens. But let's take a week and do it. Yeah, you guys should do it. But also have have the objective of pick, you know, to make your t list of 10, 20 ideal companies and then just go after them, you know? Um, and I think that you can be that, you know, that game over. It could be because of you, you know? Yeah, because I'd love to see that. that many companies that are fit for this, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's it just about finding, you know, the five, ten ones that we, it would make sense for them and just having that conversation with them about how that would look like. Because the numbers, I think, make a lot of sense. So the, the pitch is kind of pretty easy. Uh, but anyway, I thought this was a great episode. Uh, I know we, we went for a little longer, uh, but really appreciate you guys uh, for the ones that are listening, for the ones that left. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, thank you, Nemanja. Thank you. Uh, a pleasure to chat with you. And we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Are we doing next Wednesday? Yeah, cool. we're going to go with, with predictions for the 2021 when we come to our companies. Okay, that we're works. Achieve next. Awesome. That works. <laughs> All right, guys. Appreciate you very much. All right. Take care. Ciao, Ivan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.